This episode is dedicated to Sergei Karolyov, the genius who launched humanity into space, born in Zhitomir and who studied in Odessa and Kiev. Three of the most significant achievements at the dawn of the space era were masterminded by him, Sputnik, Gagarin and Leonov's first ever spacewalk. Karolyov was the genius behind the technology that made these and many other leaps possible by his contemporaries. He was simply called the chief engineer. Welcome to Slick and Curtain. All our content is also available on podcasting platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Please do like, subscribe and comment on the video as it really does help new people discover our incredible guests. Also check out the list of Ukrainian charities that are included in the description of the video. And if you like the content we produce, do please consider becoming a patron or buy me a coffee to support the work of the channel. Yaroslav Anjuk is an entrepreneur and geek who's been working towards accelerating victory for Ukraine and the democratic world. Yaroslav is the co-founder of IT companies PetCube, Spend with Ukraine, Fuel Finance, and Ozero Design. He has also recently written a fantastic article on Sergei Karolyov um, in the Kiev Independent, and we will, of course, put a link to that in the description of the video. Yaroslav, welcome to the channel. Thanks for having me. Excited to talk about Sergei Karolyov. There's a lot of details here that I wasn't aware of, and to an extent, the story of Sergei Karolyov, his Ukrainian identity was kind of erased by the Soviet authorities, wasn't it? Totally, uh, as it was for so many brilliant individuals. Uh, And in the core of it lies this ideology that uh, the individual, the one person, means nothing. And uh, it's all about this collective, the faceless, meaningless mass of people. Uh, And that's that's what is in the core of uh, uh, the Soviet ideology. Um, uh, And uh, I think that Sergei Korolev is uh, just such a, giant on the on the world scale is is a person who uh have launched humanity into space right he he out of out of the first greatest achievements in space he accomplished the top three uh launching the first satellite with sputnik and then launching the first person gagarin into space and then doing the first ever spacewalk with uh, leonov um and uh, he was so much um hidden from the general public that until his death no one even knew his name and uh few people knew about his existence uh only only at his death uh ha- ha- has the people in Soviet Union learned who he was and that extraordinary name kind of adds to the mystique as well doesn't it you know the chief constructor it's got a very uh, sort of science fiction and and slightly sort of you know paranoid thing about it um i mean was he uh would he at all have had any kind of idea that his name would become famous or did he perhaps go to his death thinking that uh, his achievements would forever only be known by a small group of experts and cosmonauts. I'm pretty sure he knew that he was achieving great deeds that will go into history. Uh, He was the one who persuaded uh, the Soviet Union to uh, launch Sputnik and to accelerate it and that it is important. Uh, He was the one who uh, persuaded uh, the, the Communist Party to pursue space exploration. He had this vision of humanity going to other planets and living among the stars. So he was this classic visionary and you know his life is so full of drama and it is such a testament of an individual's fight against the system and despite all the odds accomplishing his dreams. He it just this is such a cinema a graphic story that I would really love one of the major studios uh, to write like a mini series on Sergei Korolev, uh, and I think it would be huge success, especially in the current sort of geopolitical environment. It is a testament of uh, you know individual and uh, ingenious uh, winning against the collectivist communist system, uh, authoritarian system 
trying to destroy that individual. Uh, and I think that that reason uh, resonates very well now when, when we discuss this in 2024. And of course, it's in the context of the film Oppenheimer being such a tremendous success and, you know, very different context. But that also shows the power of individual genius fighting against a system which can be, you know, bureaucratic and can put obstacles in the way. That must have been, you know, times a thousand in the Soviet Union, though. Um, and I'd like you to talk here about the fact that, you know, now we think of the space race as, as, a, as a natural thing, almost an inevitable thing. And these great achievements of the Soviet Union, again, have a, an inevitability about them uh, that is bestowed by history. But you've mentioned here that this is very far from being the case, that, uh, you know, the Soviet authorities were really not convinced that the space race was uh, the right way to compete with the U.S., Exactly. And uh, there are actually cases of that in other areas of science. Uh, for for example, um, at some point, um, uh, both genetics and cybernetics were, were sort of proclaimed almost like the um, anti-science and sort of heresy uh, by the uh, Communist Party. And um, the, the stupidest things were done. And, uh, you know, the, the scientific progress has been stalled. For example, for cybernetics, there is another huge name uh, of uh, Viktor Hlushkov, uh, who uh, was actually living and working in Kiev, and he is the father of uh, Ukrainian and Soviet cybernetics, and he um, has created the first uh, uh, per personal uh, sort of uh, computational machine in the continental Europe. Um, so ju just after uh, some, some first of these machines were created in, in the UK. Um, and he uh, and his work has also been forgotten partly because of uh, these wrong decisions by the Communist Party. And you know, what, what is so impressive uh, about Korolev is that he was so many times uh, you know, escaping death by 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 the uh, nails of his fingers. You know, first time he was captured by the KGB in 1939, and he was beaten to half death. And it was right before the World War II um, has uh, started, and a few years before the World War II, um, uh, will be before Hitler invaded the Soviet Union. But obviously, the Soviets and the Germans divided Pol Poland by the uh, Ribbentrop uh, M M Molotov Pact in uh, 1939. But so, as a part of the cleansing in the tops of Soviet engineering and military command, uh, he was captured, he was beaten to death, his jaw was broken, and then he was sent um, somewhere to Siberia on a completely fabricated um, uh, premises. Uh, as as uh, you know, um, so, some kind of uh, uh, perpetrator or whatever, a person who was um, uh, doing something bad for the Soviet Union, and so he was working there on uh, some really like a gold mine or something like that in horrible conditions. Um, he was close to death uh, when miraculously, due to efforts of his mom. Uh, she 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 managed to lobby somehow so that all the convictions were dropped against him, and he was let go. And so when he was let go, that was the the maybe third time when he almost died because he tried to get to Vladivostok, a city in the far far uh, eastern Russia, and um, to catch the last um, steamboat that would go all the way through the north uh, to Saint Petersburg, and that the navigation back then was only open in the sort of summertime because in the winter it would be all ice and there would be no no way through. So there was this last boat that should go called, Tung uh, I'm not sure, I think Tunguska was the name of the boat, but he narrowly missed that boat. He was so much in pain and so sad about this because that would mean he will not see his family for another half a year. But then that, that, that boat hit some iceberg or something and all the people that were on there, like over a thousand people have actually, like almost all have died. And some people were actually rescued by a Japanese 
vote, which the Soviet, um, again, the, the Soviet Communist Party would not even communicate about because they were sort of at odds with J Japanese and they didn't, didn't want to hum humanize them. So it's like these three events being captured by KGB, almost dying on, a, on some crazy gold mine and then almost dying because of mi missing, missing the steamboat. Each of them could have stopped humanity's progress in space exploration or slow it down by at least a decade, if not more. Like if we think that uh, this, the Soyuz space capsule, which was engineered by Korolev back in the 50s and 60s, has been still used in um, in in the last decade, and like in uh, 2011, after Americans stopped the uh, space shuttle program and they had to use Russian rockets to get to the space station, the Soyuz capsule was used. It was designed by Korolev. How crazy is that, right? Um, and there are so many episodes in his life that are like that. Um, so it really makes it cinem cinem cinematographic. Well, I think the I think the boat was called Indigirka. I think that was the name of the, yes, the boat that correct. he missed. Um, yeah. But you've raised an, an incredible point here, which is here you have an extraordinary individual. And we'll come to his background in a minute. But he's not just fighting against Stalinist terror and against all of these totally sort of unpredictable accidents, incidents, etc. He was specifically denounced by colleagues, wasn't he? And then he was specifically rescued by the incredible personality of his mother who uh, uh, and some colleagues as well who tried to advocate on his behalf. So you've got sort of blind chance, but you've also got these mechanisms of the Soviet system where actually strong personality can condemn you to death, but strong personality can also help to save you. Um, it's an incredible story. Indeed. Indeed, it is. Um, let's turn to the colleague, though, who denounced. Do you know, I mean, how common were denunciations? And I get the impression as well that, you know, it, we're, we're quite judgmental about people who might denounce others, including, you know, scientific colleagues. But the use of torture was widespread. Um and if you think of, say, you know, Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible, about the Salem witch trials, this form of sort of denunciations and tortures always tends to, you know, expand to include numerous innocent people. And you can't 100 percent blame people for, you know, telling lies to save themselves. Do we know the details? Because in your article, you've also said that later in his career, he had to actually work with the person who he came to discover had denounced him. Yeah, indeed. That, that was, you know, the denunciations like that one were sort of the product of the Soviet system, which encouraged people to report on each other. And there was sort of, for, for people, there was a combination of fear, self-protection uh, mechanism, and moral degradation. And with the, the totalitarian systems, they they are characterized by this way of controlling the masses, where they create circumstances and laws and conditions where uh, people, every person has to feel guilty for something, and then every person has to feel fear of being, uh, you know, um, being attacked uh, at any any moment, and. Uh, those um, mechanisms allow you to control the massive population over uh, vast uh, territories. Um, and unfortunately, those are sort of the methods that, that have been used by totalitarian regimes over and over the history and in different places of the world. So that is what uh, happened in the Soviet Union, uh, happened with Korolev, happened with so, so many others. And um, I think it is also important Sort of when we when we talk about Soviet Union, I, I think there are many things globally that are misunderstood, starting with its name. So it has union in its name. So it's sort of like the United States also has a union or the United Kid Kingdom, you know, it's sort of the same union, but it's not really the same. And what Soviet Union was, indeed, it was rather uh, a, an occupation of a number of territories by Russia. And then calling all of that union, it's not like 
you know, uh, the, the state's uh, representatives came together and decided to make uh, the United States of America. Um, uh, so starting with that, and then you basically dive into a series of lies and lies and lies of how uh, that state has functioned. And those lies are so much ingrained in, in the minds of the global population here. It doesn't matter be it a Chinese or Japanese researcher or uh, an American or a British or a European one, um, that uh, I think we, we have a lot of work to do just sort of uh, unlearning some of the things that we thought we knew and learning them again. Um, so that, that's like what one of those stories is uh, how we should think about that um, uh, that that, that uh, movement or or uh, phenomena of people reporting other people for no apparent reason or out of uh, you know seemingly moral degradation that was not like not so much an individual's fault as a result of sort of state superimposing a set of rules on all the individuals. Uh, so I'm not even like rushing to judge the person who have reported Sergei Korolev and then was working together with him because who knows, maybe that person's kids were taken hostages or something else. Exactly. But there's another feature of the system you know, you've got terror, um, but even in periods where the terror abates and reduces, for instance, in the, in the seventies and the eighties, it's still an autocracy, but it's not uh, as brutal and, uh, and, and, and wasteful as the Stalinist period. Um, and even now, there are some features of this that have clearly survived, and that is nepotism. That is finding your way in a kind of hierarchy. You may be an unimaginative person. You may not have uh, much in the way of uh, professional aspiration, uh, but you gain privilege. You gain material privileges as well by being part of this hierarchy. And it does seem that throughout Russian history, there's a there's a common occurrence here of the system being designed to benefit people who are loyal and who are in some ways mediocre. And they form then a kind of natural barrier against people who perhaps are going to rock the boat, come up with revolutionary ideas. How on earth totally. did someone like Karolov get into this role in a system that seems to be designed to actually repress people uh, with the kind of characteristics that he had? Well, I I think, uh, first of all, he was an incredibly smart and talented person, right? His uh, his um, inspiration with uh, aviation and engineering started in a very uh, early age, and he was he was born in Zhitomir. He was growing up in the uh, central Ukraine city of Nizhen. Uh, he was brought up by his mom and his grandparents. Who are uh, who were all Ukrainian descent and sort of raised him on on Ukrainian songs and culture and so on, and he was very well well educated. He constructed his first airplane in his uh, early twenties, and he actually called it Koktebel, which is Koktebel is um, the name of a resort in uh, southern Crimea. So uh, that is just so significant and so meaningful these days as Crimea is still being occupied by Russia. Uh, and because of his just intellectual powers and his insane love and dedication for engineering and uh, aerospace industry, uh, which was just, you know, getting started back then in the 20s and the 30s, um, he had to find a way to work with that system that he was given. And then of course, us, when we're judging about him, we're judging from uh, the modern age. But back then, obviously, uh, growing up in, in, in the Soviet Union, so he didn't know much about um, how else the society could function. So he was just capturing some of those uh, features of, the, of the, the society and figuring out with his bare intellect how to move forward and how to you know reach his dreams which were about aviation and space i read in your article as well it it had echoes of kind of steve jobs in that uh, he's got this incredibly high standards 
Um, he expects people who are surrounding him to be at the sort of peak of excellence and to put everything in. You know, he sounds very much like a modern tech entrepreneur. Was he also able, as part of that, to attract similarly minded people, talented people, to be parts of his teams? Was he able to kind of inspire them? And and you also mentioned the article. There's a little bit of fear there as well. You know, you want to please him. You want to do the best. But you also are worried that you might not be up to the right standard. Totally. That's what his contemporaries uh, spoke about him. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite, favorite quotes that he used was uh, that uh, people who want to work look for uh, means to achieve the result, whereas people who don't want to work uh, look for reasons uh, why they cannot achieve it. Uh, and I think that's a very powerful quote and really a, a Steve Jobs-esque one. Uh, so he's that kind of character. Um, but he actually indeed managed to persuade some of the most brilliant people uh, to work with him. And uh, the story of Sputnik is fascinating uh, because uh, it took, well, and, and, you know, riffing on my on my previous uh, idea that we should sort of rethink the Soviet Union as as a, as a group of different nations that were under occupation of of the center with with the center in, in Moscow and Kremlin. Uh, there, there were like three Ukrainians involved in launching Sputnik. One of them was Sergei Korolev, who was um, the chief engineer and the person who was like the visionary behind the idea. But the rocket, which was used to launch it, was using the engines. Are made by another Ukrainian from Odessa, and his last name is Lushko. Uh, and uh, then there was actually 30 Ukrainian involved, which was Khrushchev. And Khrushchev, uh, the general secretary of the uh, Soviet Union, has Ukrainian roots, as, as weird as it is as well. Um, so uh, the genius of Korolev was that he was able not only to engineer these things, but also to gather those different people together persuade them to work together, uh, persuade the, the party to approve this, uh, to give him the resources and and to really um, get this achievement. Um, and, uh, you know, when, until Korolev was alive, there was the time when the Soviet space program was, was really thriving and, you know, modules, landing modules for um, uh, uh, the moon and Venus were developed and so some of them have actually landed already after Korolev's death and a new and more ambitious programs were getting started and so on and he while he was competing with the other engineers uh, along Soviet Union uh, uh, while he was alive he had the most resources and he had achieved the, the most uh, um, remarkable achievements uh, and after his death um, that all sort of model fell apart because there were different com conflicting fractions of different engineers um, and uh, the, the Soviet rocket pro program has never uh, returned to its sort of former glory after uh, Sarahi has passed. And there is actually a lot of sort of mystery around his death as well, which I didn't necessarily write a lot in, in the article, but um, it was very sort of on paper, it seems like he had a very mundane operation and then something didn't go right. And then uh, he, he died. Uh, and there are, you know, different rumors that uh, maybe uh, someone helped him to die. Maybe this was not like a death of, of unnatural reasons. Uh, and that there were like some archives about that. They were top secret and there was no access to them. And obviously now all of that is in uh, Moscow. Um, so again, you know, the more I sort of dug into his biography and into his personality and so on, the more I realized that that's just such a movie character, you know. And it's not uncommon, is it, in a system like the Soviet one and indeed the modern Russian one, that if you do really stand out, if you push ahead of other people and start to build, I would say, a sort of strong reputation, I and mean, this is a completely different character, a reprehensible character, nothing like Karolov, but Prigozhin pushed his head out and certainly he was distinguished from other people. And then you create a lot of enemies, you create jealousy, you create rivalries. And um, 
you might be seen as an alternative source of power and influence. And the system has a way of, yeah, destroying people who uh, who, who rise above it, as it were. So that's certainly uh, a possibility. That's a very anti-human and anti-individualist person. And, you know, I think a lot of sort of modern discourse uh, about these different ways, different societies function, it, it, it sort of shifted towards this more of a economic and sort of policy plane of sort of capitalism versus socialism and so on. And I, I think it is actually very helpful to have this sort of collectivist versus individualist frame, framework. And uh, when, once you sort of use that framework, it helps you understand uh, many, uh, many things. So in this collectivist framework, you know, that there is sort of all anim or, or all animals are equal, but, you know, the party is is more equal than the others. Um, and uh, that's exactly what what is happening in the, in the modern day Russia. Um, and um, again, you know, I think you know, when we talk about Soviet Union, it's it's very helpful to uh, try like start distinguishing like different groups within the Soviet Union, different centers. And U Ukraine, uh, for example, has uh, had always its own sort of subjectivity within that union. And um, it also had its own sort of distinct features. Um, and But at the same time, there are so many things that were forgotten or, say, attributed to Russia. Um, and, for example, Korolev, if you look at, uh, you know, I'm not sure what the, the English Wikipedia says about him, but I'm sure that in, in the global consciousness, he is perceived as Russian, whereas he was clearly Ukrainian. He uh, I self-identified as Ukrainian. He spoke Ukrainian. His first publications were in Ukrainian. His parents are Ukrainian. And his and Polish. Character... I think he has Ukrainian-Polish ancestry mixed, uh, is it? I don't think so. I, I think that that might be more true about uh, Kazimir Malevich, uh, the uh, famous yeah. okay. artist. Uh, he he has Polish ancestry as well, but he also have actually called himself uh, a Ukrainian. And th there are so many characters like that. For example, uh, you mentioned earlier Ryepin, uh, the great artist, or uh, Tchaikovsky, in fact, a uh, composer. He's also Ukrainian heritage, but all of that is now being attributed to so-called a great uh, Russian culture, which is um, it's just a cultural appropriation. Uh, it's not nothing other than that. So again, I think we need to sort of re, uh, like unlearn and uh, learn new some of the some of the facts. And again, even for uh, the actual Russian culture, which is or uh, Russian achievements, which like you can say like Mendeleev or uh, someone like Tolstoy, Do Dostoevsky, for those guys to exist, actually hundreds and thousands of prominent individuals from the other states were just murdered. So there was this uh, uh, not very widely known a place in Russia uh, called uh, Sandra Moh. Uh, and that's a place where over uh, a thousand representatives of Ukrainian intelligentsia were murdered in, in the 60s. Uh, and that was just part of this genocide and part of destroying national elites of the former Soviet republics in order to subjugate all the population to one sort of center in Moscow. So whenever someone tells me about, you know, the great achievements of, of uh, Russian uh, science or literature or music, you know, I, I tell them this story and I explain to them that for one Tolstoy to exist, they had to murder a uh, hundred Ukrainian um, you know, talented uh, musicians and writers and scientists. Uh, so it is doubly uh, sort of unusual that Korolev, despite all of that, despite all of that genocide and unfairness and so on, due to, to his uh, talent and ingenuity, he was not only able to survive, but actually be, be, became a father of, of space exploration and opened it up not only for the Soviets, not only for the Ukrainians, but to be frank, for the whole world, and he has inspired accomplishments around the globe. Um, so he's he's really an inspirational figure for me. And this is this is an interesting area, isn't it? Because of course the Soviet Union. And you talked about um, 
uh, you know, the way geopolitics is discussed and certain things are considered yeah, you know, beneath those discussions. Another one is nationality. And even in many geopolitical discussions, especially those who tend to put more of a, I would say, a Moscow centric or a narrative that's beneficial to Moscow, they tend to discount the influence of um, nationality on upbringing uh, and and sort of you know certain national uh, features uh, that can influence character. These are kind of put aside as being unimportant. But it seems to me your description of Karelov, he sounds extraordinarily Ukrainian because we see parallels in the current day of the explosion of um, civil society and people getting involved in Ukrainian resilience, in trying to help the armed forces and do whatever they can. You know, even if they're not serving on the front, Many, many people are doing all sorts of things that benefit the war effort. And it seems to be a problem solving, a future oriented problem solving, uh, you know, solution minded kind of thing. Like, here's something that's broken. I'm not going to wait for the government or somebody else to fix it. Right. No one's doing anything like this. Oh, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. And I've spoken to so many dozens and dozens of people who have that attitude. There are far. It's, it's not a, a core I would say, characteristic of of um, the Russian mindset. And when it does emerge, it seems to be, you know, killed off very, very quickly or discouraged. Um, would you say, therefore, that, you know, Korolov may not have been able to really push his Ukrainian identity and ancestry, but through his actions and behaviours and mindset, uh, would you characterise that as very distinctly Ukrainian? Totally, yeah. I think you're you're capturing the the key the key factor about this, and that is um, that is what is called freedom or liberty. Uh, people striving for freedom has been a characteristic uh, sort of quality of uh, Ukrainians and people who have lived uh, on Ukrainian lands for uh, thousands of years. In fact. Um, you know, this is funny because after the Revolution of Dignity uh, in 2014, there was this huge banner hanging on uh, on the main square of Kiev saying freedom is our religion. And uh, in, in the last decades, uh, key public intellectuals in Ukraine all converge around this idea, which I fully support and it's something sort of I came to independently as well, that uh, freedom is is one characteristic feature of Ukrainian people. If you look as far back as to the um, uh, the, the first uh, first millennia AD and the founding of Kiev uh, some 15 uh, centuries ago, and how that Kiev and Rus state, the proto-Ukrainian state has developed, uh, it was uh, a very interesting state. It was one of the first in these territories to adapt some set of laws. Um, it was also characterized by the constant uprisings of the uh, peasants. Um, and um, at some point when the Golden Horde came to these lands, uh, that, that actually be became the sort of and of a, a golden era of Kiev and Rus. And the Golden Horde had actually been stopped in Ukraine by Ukraine's didn't, didn't go much further west. Um, and it sort of, as I'm, as I'm telling this, sort of reminds me of the events that are happening now as we speak. And now it's, it's not a golden, but this Russian horde is being stopped in Ukraine. Uh, but what happened when the Golden Horde came to Moscow, which only was getting started back then. Uh, we're talking about like 13th century or whatnot. The Moscow has immediately agreed to sort of pay the tribute and it basically became one of the sort of um, uh, the, the Golden Horde's captured cities and it, it kept capitulated immediately. But the Kiev, uh, it actually decided to fight and it lost that, that fight. It was burned down. And uh, for a number of centuries, there was um, no like a, a serious government governance here until uh, many many generations have changed. And um, 
then we have sort of the Kazakh state appearing. And the Kazakh means a free person. So Ukrainian Kazakh state appeared between the Russia and the Poland and uh, was quite powerful for a few centuries uh, before it was again subjugated by, uh, by the Russians and the Poles. Uh, and then you have this, uh, again, short period of Ukrainian uh, sort of statehood in, in the early 20th centuries, around uh, 1918 to 1920. Um, and, you know, throughout all of that history, uh, you have this line of willing to be free that is being passed from generation to generation in the literature, in art, in uh, constant uprisings and efforts to create a state. And that's again and again what you're seeing now in the 21st century Ukrainians, you know, having three revolutions, um, you know, within within three year, uh, thir 30 years, and then uh, Russians still being this sort of, um, unfortunately, um, a mass of people that uh, can, can do nothing against uh, the tyrant and can only uh, sort of uh, submit to its to its will. So I think those are very distinctive uh, features that really differentiate these uh, these two groups of people, um, and that's what we're seeing with uh, Serhii just manifesting with this his personality as well. And of course, he wasn't able to uh, express himself politically, but do you think he found uh, an element of freedom uh, within this process of of uh, obviously uh, you know driving the space race and these extraordinary technical achievements? I actually am not sure that he wasn't. I think he did express him politically in, in the ways that uh, remarkably have survived to our time for us to decipher. For example, some of his first uh, scientific publications were done in Kharkiv, in Ukrainian language, and they were actually on a liquid uh, jet propulsion. Um, and back then, like, why would you publish in Ukrainian? Like, everything was in Russian, right? Uh, and then at some point, the first song that was uh, ever played in space was the one uh, played to him as, 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 as a gift for him. He was still alive. And there was a Ukrainian song, song. and the song in Ukrainian is called Chumuya uh, Nesokil, uh, which basically uh, translates as Why Am I Not a Falcon? And the, the words of that song uh, translate to something like, I'm looking at the skies and I'm, and I'm having this thought and I'm thinking, why am I not a falcon? Why can't I fly? So how poetic and how uh, how matching to the aerospace industry is that? That was before the uh, thousand year Falcon uh, became a sci-fi thing, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. I think these are small messages that Korolev has left as, as breadcrumbs of his life for us to uh, later judge about his uh, actual thoughts and views. Um, and his actually his daughter uh, has told in numerous interviews that whenever they would talk about Ukraine in and within their family, there was always this incredible warmth and respect and appreciation for the land, for the people, um, which um, I think again are uh, very characteristic of Sahi. And I think that gives a really strong portrait of the man and his achievements. The sort of last question here really will turn back to his technical achievements, because what we know of collectivization and industrialization and indeed a lot of Soviet industry is that it was extraordinarily inefficient, massively inefficient, wasteful of energy, wasteful of human resources. Um, you know, they boast about the output and the you know, number of factories and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But when you look into the figures, the actual uh, quality of product generally is is low the amount of product that is produced which is non-usable uh you know the fail rate of parts and so on incredibly high so massively wasteful system and yet his Karolov, through his technical brilliance force of personality he's able to get people to create technologies which were reliable 
and which carried on performing uh, with with a relatively low fail rate for decades and decades. Hence, why you said earlier that they are you know used uh, nearly up until the present day to 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 launch um, uh, you know uh, people to the International Space Station. This doesn't happen by accident, does it? As a technologist and engineer, I'm sure you will say this is not accidental. It's due to intelligence, process, force of personality, all these kind of things. So I'd like to, to talk about really how he managed to achieve that. Well, I think this is just the very same way as any driven, brilliant entrepreneur of our time. Uh, this is through sheer focus on the result and applying your intellect for problem solving and just like thinking from the first principles. Um, so he was extremely focused, extremely driven, uh, focused on the first principles. And that's how he achieved that. And um, look, Soviet metallurgy was a product of uh, of Soviet space program and was unmatched for globally for many decades after its golden era. And uh, the, the great metallurgy allowed uh, Soviet rockets and rocket engines to use extremely uh, firm alloys that could withstand incredible temperatures and incredible pressure, thus achieving uh, you know, a much greater engine efficiency, specific impulse, and so on, which were unmatched by the West for many decades and only now are sort of being uh, over overachieved and overthrown by the accomplishments of SpaceX and the modern space programs um so it does take a personality to ensure that because i the inertia of the system seems the, to show that the, the quality goes down and, the, down and down and down yeah that's right and i think that because of his achievements he was still able to sort of get certain power and um you know subdue at least parts of the system to his will uh, and make it uh, the way he uh, uh, he believes is reasonable. That's incredibly insightful. It's been hugely enjoyable talking on this subject. Um, if you've got any recommendations for sort of books or autobiographies, we'll have a little look there because I think that's a it's a subject that I think a lot of people will want to to learn more about. And if anyone who's a film producer is listening, this of course would be a fabulous subject for a film. Um, and there's so many issues here of the individual versus the collective fighting bureaucracy, you know, the power of sort of uh, genius personality. But also you've got a Ukrainian at the heart of the story. And I think that uh, that's what people need to be thinking a lot more of in uh, in the world, getting Ukrainians into stories and narratives. Yeah, I think he is a great character which helps the world to better understand Ukraine and this whole part of the world that used to be Soviet Union, but would be more fittingly called the Soviet occupied territories. Um, and I think we really need a great movie about him. Uh, and that would help people to unlearn and learn a new many things about the world, many important things. Yaroslav, what a pleasure it was speaking to you. Thank you so much for sharing these insights with the audience. We'll pop a link to the article so people can follow up on that. And uh, yeah, it's been brilliant. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Thanks for doing this.